Have we forgotten in our time that when the Nazi regime came into being, it came through the minds of the most educated people of their time? And the same men who devised the concentration camps sat enthralled before the music of Wagner. The human mind and its capacity to somehow make this assumption that if we educate ourselves, if we feed ourselves, we will all be contented and peaceful one with another. And the resulting philosophy of yielding to that temptation would be the philosophy of materialism starting with a capital M. A la Marxism, a la existentialism, a la humanism, that which strips the spirit of its essential nature and makes man purely matter. I have been in so many university debates and I can hardly wait for the professor or somebody to make this comment because I know it is going to come. Think of all the wars that religions have produced, all the people that in the name of God have been exterminated, all for religious circumstances. And I pause and ask them if they have ever counted the number of people who have been killed in the name of godlessness. Let me give you two examples. And there is a difference. When they have killed in the name of godlessness, they were working with the logical outworking of their own assumptions. Those who in the name of religion have done it, have done it illogically, hardly following the very person of Christ, but their own infrastructure that they had set up. So there's at least that comfort that this was an illogical outworking. With humanism, it becomes a logical outworking. In fact, if you read Charles Darwin, and I looked through some of his earliest notes at Cambridge University, which he used to study, Charles Darwin said the thing that terrified him about his own philosophy is that if it is right, then nature, red in tooth and claw, is only going to expand itself on the basis of destruction. And he even commented on some of the wars that had taken place as actually being good things in the progress of the evolutionary ladder, it was necessary when man was the measure of all things. And it frightened him. Two examples. One of Stalin. As Muggeridge and I were walking in his lawn, he told me this. I've seen it subsequently documented by Paul Johnson, the British historian, in his book Modern Times. Muggeridge said this as we were walking. He said, you know, I had Svetlana Stalin come and stay here with me for a few days. And he says, Mrs. Zacharias, I will never forget while she was living with me, we were doing a production for the BBC. Three times in those few short days, she said to me, Mr. Muggeridge, can you help me understand something about my father? She said, you know, when he was dying and we were standing by his bedside, remember now Stalin only stood about five feet, four inches tall. He hardly cut a towering countenance, but his eyes were of steel and Stalin was his nickname because of the steeliness that they saw in his personality. This man was once upon a time preparing to go into the ministry and was in a seminary education program and then lost his faith in God. And Lenin selected Stalin as a hand-picked man because of his hatred for things religious. When Stalin renounced everything and had an avowed hatred for things religious, Lenin handpicked him to succeed him. At the last moment, he came in quicker than Lenin would have liked. But here is now Svetlana telling Muggeridge, she says, you know, can you tell me something about my dad? Here is a man who had been responsible for exterminating about 15 million people, his own people, as blood was flowing in the land because of Stalin. She said, you know, Mr. Muggeridge, while he lay in bed, his arms were flaying around him, hallucinating, as if wolves were fastening him as a prey unto themselves. And as they were closing in on him, he was waving his hands and hallucinating. And then she said this, the last thing my father did, the last thing my father did, is he half sat up in bed, weak and worn out, fatigued from the hallucination and the sickness. He half sat up in the bed, clenched his fist towards the heavens, threw his head back onto the pillow, and he was gone. Can you imagine that as a final gesture of a human being? One more clenched fist against you, O oh God. It's all right to say man is the measure of all things. Which man? Hitler? Stalin, Hefner. Let me give you another illustration of this, of the materialistic philosophy working itself out. Hitler, who took Nietzsche's philosophy and gave it working power. 
just as Alexander the Great took uh, Aristotelian thinking and wanted to spread it across the world, as it were, so we've got Hitler taking Nietzschean thought and using his Superman philosophy to obliterate the weak, one of the weak being uh, Christianity, which had to be in his image, pushed away as a tightrope walker so the stronger man can walk this rope towards Supermandom. I remember preaching in Warsaw, and I'll never forget as long as I live, and my wife was with me, we were driven over to Auschwitz, and I recall seeing an American teenage girl there tear out of a room because she couldn't handle it anymore, as she was terrified that this century has witnessed what it has witnessed. In one room you see denuded children, castrated boys, pictures on the wall. Joseph Mengele carried on his dastardly experiments out there. And in another room you see 14,000 pounds of women's hair stacked up behind glass. As the women were sent into gas ovens and then scalped, the hair was taken, woven into gunny sacks, and sold in the market, as it were. They were obliterating them at the rate of 12,000 every day. As millions were obliterated in the name of a superman, in the name of a super race, the logical outworking of a materialistic philosophy, man merely, the measure of all things. Do you know, men like Turner and the other of his ilk would be very wise if they read some of their own gurus of 30 years ago. Take a man like Jean-Paul Sartre, the French existentialist, who was a household name in university students at that time, the godfather of existentialism in those days. Jean-Paul Sartre's philosophy was what was transmitted to the Anka Lea movement in Cambodia, which resulted in the slaughter of well over a million people. Sartre was the ideological godfather of the Anka Lea movement. He was, an, he was a hedonistic, pleasure-oriented man. Yet Jean-Paul Sartre himself, on his deathbed, finally said, I have to disavow this which I have believed in atheism. I no longer can agree with the concept that this world doesn't have a designer. And his mistress standing by his bedside said, there you are, he's gone senile. Well, that's quite a statement. And it candidly illustrates that an atheistic and pleasure-centered lifestyle is ultimately unlivable. We've been listening to part two of Ravi Zacharias' message, Absolute Truth in Relative Terms. If you or someone you know is engaged in that search, we recommend you pick up a copy of this complete presentation. It gives you a clear view of the dangers our culture has drifted into in recent decades and shows us a hope for recovery. It's part of a two-CD set entitled Created for Significance, and it's available when you call us at one 800 448 6766. Our number once again is 1 800 448 6766. To order online or browse our other mind building resources, visit our website at rzim.org. That's rzim.org. There you can also sign up for our triannual Just Thinking newsletter and discover A Slice of Infinity, our daily devotional email. Once again, that's rzim.org. Just Thinking is a listener-supported radio presentation of Ravi Zacharias International Ministries. We appreciate your prayers and ongoing support. If you'd like to send us a financial gift, write to us at RZIM, Post Office Box 921-939, Norcross, Georgia, 30010. That's RZIM, Post Office Box 921-939, Norcross, Georgia, 30010. Finally, join us again tomorrow as Ravi shares part three of Absolute Truth in Relative Terms. Until then, keep thinking. You want to find the answer to violence? I take you to one scene in history. Stand in front of the cross and take a look at that cross as violence hurled its hate on him, as all the anguish of humanity was poured upon him. And he looked at that motley crowd and prayed for mercy for that crowd. It is only as we understand what the cross is and what the cross does and what the cross can do that we will ever understand what it is to respond to violence, injustice, and evil. And we have no answer until we have found the answer in our own heart through the provision that is made on the cross for yourself and myself and the violent